Dr. Besije, it's a pleasure meeting you. Uh, for many people, you're an icon. Uh, you're a legend uh, in politics, uh, in pro-democracy movements and struggles in East Africa, but also around the world. Uh, there's a lot of young people who have been born uh, after 2000, the year 2000, who may not know that much your history, although you have been have, had quite recently as well run-ins with a uh, lot of uh, trouble for your stand on democracy. Uh, the first question that comes to mind is that uh, you started off as uh, basically a doctor in, in the military uh, service, but also you were very close with uh, Museveni. Uh, what happened uh, about that and what was the fallout? Well, thanks, Maria, for having me and um, <clears throat> for the kind words uh, of uh, introduction. Um, I know I didn't start off as a doctor in the military. I started off as a doctor in civilian life. Uh, I was a young doctor at the time of transition from the rule of Idi Amin and uh, the post Idi Amin governments that led to the first election in Uganda after uh, it happened after 18 years. We had never had an election. So the first election after 18 years happened in 1980. And uh, in that election, as I've said, I was a young doctor. I supported a party led by now President Museveni. The party was called Uganda Patriotic Movement. It was a new party in Uganda and uh, many people did not know it. But the reason some of us young people supported it was because we were not involved with the independence parties that had caused the problems we had endured for the period we were uh, in school and uh, all our early years in life. And so we thought we should have a new platform. And that's why we supported a new platform led by um, Museveni then. And... Uh, the problem was that that election was not fair at all. There was use of force by the military to influence the outcome of that election. And uh, uh, eventually the electoral commission that organized the election was deposed as it had started giving out results. It was sacked by the military commission which was managing the transition and all the powers of the electoral commission reverted to the military commission and uh, they announced whatever they wanted. Following that, Museveni started a war against the new government that was sworn in now of President Milton Obote. Those of us who supported the party of Mr. Museveni then got into trouble and uh, I was one of the early victims. I was arrested tortured, nearly killed, and uh, I ran into Nairobi, where we are today, uh, into exile, and served briefly in the Aga Khan Hospital at the Kenyatta National Hospital. But I left Uganda a wounded person because I realized that life meant nothing, that um, I could have been killed, for actually no offense whatsoever. I even didn't have any connection with the people who were fighting in the bush. And so I left Uganda uh, an annoyed person and determined to do something to end that kind of impunity and, uh, and abuse of rights that was taking place in our country. And so that's how I looked for a way to now join up with those who were fighting led by Museveni. And in 1982, I was able to do so. So I linked with the fighters and went back to Uganda and joined into the fighting. So I joined as a civilian medical doctor and uh, participated in the war uh, up to the end in 1986. And then, and we had, I believed that in, after the war, I would go back to my medical practice, but it was never to be because after the war, then I went, with, I served in government. I was appointed a minister then in 1986. And for four years, I was in government. 
until then i realized that uh, our vision our mission of uh, uh, working for a transition from uh, control of power by force to control of power by popular will uh, was not going to happen under Museveni. I saw him taking the country in the direction that we had just come. And, and we argued until we disagreed, until I now chose to oppose him in what he was doing. And that's how eventually I ended up where I am today. <laughs> so what, what do you think pushes you, despite being, of course, a medical doctor, you continue uh, and you're relentless. I mean, that's why I called you a legend because uh, anybody who, who sees your photo, hears your name, what they associate you with is this uh, completely complete dedication to a struggle, which is a struggle for democracy, a, a struggle for free and fair elections. And uh, as, as you rightfully pointed out, that's not how you started your path. You could have chosen basically to continue with your medical career what really pushes you every single time? Every single time they beat you, they torture you, and that's something that I would like to talk a little bit about, but every single time when you're completely flawed, you get up and you move on. What drives you? Um, frankly, I don't know what uh, drives people. I don't know what drives you to do what you do. I, I am a Christian too, and I believe that there is something uh, that uh, is called the grace of God. <laughs> I think there are powers that uh, guide us into whatever we do and sustain us in doing them. But over and beyond that, I think what motivated me, as I have said that in the beginning, was the realization that the only country I can call my country where I can have the full range of rights, where I should have the full range of rights that are inherent, that are not granted by anybody, is a country now called Uganda. In fact, for the short time that I was outside as a refugee here in Kenya, in those early parts of 1980, it was clear that a, a, a one would never have the enjoyment of rights as, as one can have in one's own country. I was called an alien, and I was given an alien's card <laughs> to, 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 to move on. And there are certain things I could do, certain things I couldn't do. Uh, so uh, the fact that, you know, one needs to have a country that you call yours, in which you have determination of what happens there, and in which you can enjoy not just the rights, but the opportunities, the full range of opportunities in that country, is something that uh, uh, I, I, I got attracted to through those traumatic uh, circumstances that, uh, you know, really, uh, transformed my life from the professional young medical worker to uh, a person seeking rights and, uh, and uh, wanting to live in dignity in my own country. Uh, having seen the suffering, incidentally, when I was arrested and detained before I escaped into Kenya, Many of the people that I was incarcerated with have never been seen, you know, up to now. Uh, so many people have died uh, like that. The war then we got sucked in led to in untold suffering of millions of people. It's estimated that half a million people died in that war, and indeed, so many scars have been gathered and uh, now created into some kind of memorial 
uh, you know, places uh, where all these cars are gathered. People, many of them who were innocent uh, citizens, uh, who were not even aware of why the war was there, who were living in their villages but got caught up in this uh, war, in the crossfire, and, um, and many people died. People's lives were turned upside down. Those who were in schools had to leave the schools that they were in, and, um, and so on and so forth. This process has been of, of seeking to have that country that we desire has cost many people unbelievable sacrifices you know who many people who have lost their lives who were civilians in the areas that got engulfed in the war their properties were decimated the lives of many young people were turned upside down they could not go to school they could not uh, uh, live normal lives uh, the young people who became fighters in that struggle many lost their lives believing that they are sacrificing their lives for a Uganda in which there would be justice, in which uh, everybody would have equal opportunities and a full range of rights. And, 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 and so uh, I feel the burden of all those people who uh, made those kinds of sacrifices, where, whether willfully, whether uh, you know, caught up in these processes, but hoping that that suffering would deliver a country in which at least some people would enjoy. Now, so those of us who are still lucky to be alive, I think it would be extremely, the utmost betrayal to give up and the country continues in pretty much the same way, if not worse, than what propelled us to get into the struggle that, uh, that, that caused all that uh, suffering. And, and so I, I feel that burden. Uh, and, um, you know, I have spent the greatest part now of my life uh, when I went to war, I was in my early 20s, mid 20s. I'm now in my mid 60s. <laughs> uh, years. Yes, uh, uh, you know, and uh, uh, so uh, the, 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 stopping now uh, would not salvage anything anyway. But if I cannot start a new life, go out and start a new life in another country or whatever. So th that's why I, you know, um, determined to continue uh, to the extent that I can uh, to see that, you know, by the grace of God, we live a country, at least in which our children and uh, grandchildren can have better prospects than we have had. One of the things, and moving to politics, that I think when I said that, you know, untire or tirelessly you have been fighting uh, for, for democracy has been the fact that you've run in a number of elections. And you became the face of what they call the opposition, the person who dared to oppose openly and sincerely Museveni. Um, those elections, every single time those elections took place, there was, at the beginning, from what I understood, and you can correct me, it was, it was more of, of a sleet of hands, of covering up, but there was some appearance of, 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 of election. And, as, and my observation has been, as the years went by, it became more and more repressive. Uh, you faced more and more physical threats, physical violence, assaults. One of the funniest, uh, I think, well, it's not that funny, but if you do laugh a little bit sadly, is that you have to gear up almost in like a war, like you're in a war zone when you go to cover uh, the election campaigns that you've been conducting. What do you think of the fact that you have been running again and again and you're not getting the results you want? Is there an improvement in any way? Because it does look almost like it's a desperate situation. You see, what we have to appreciate is that what 
happened in Uganda in from the time the military took our our forces took over government in 1986 is that and and also the history of before our forces took over in 1986 is that since independence no leader of Uganda has ever left power peacefully similarly no leader has assumed office peacefully so whoever has left was chased by bombs and whoever has come into office was brought by bombs which translates into meaning that Ugandans the people of Uganda have no role in bringing people into office or taking them out it's the force of arms so Ugandans have no political voice they don't determine who rules who governs the country they don't determine how the country is governed it's the forces that determine that so in 1986 when the forces now in which i was serving took over power in fact the declaration that was made on that day the 26th day of january 1986 stated that whereas on this day the 26th of january the national resistance army has captured the power of U of state of uganda it shall now be vested in the national resistance movement so the power was captured by the army and vested in the political wing of the army which and both the military and the political wing were led by Mr Museveni and he leads the same up to today <laughs> so it has to be understood that the power of Uganda from 1986 up to now is in the hands of the national resistance army we are now renamed uganda people's defense forces and exercised by the nrm led by Muse, both are led by museveni so the people have no vote and some of these so the the mission of the national resistance movement as written as exp expressed incidentally in the early years of the nrm i was like the ideologue of nrm i was i held a post a post called the national political commissar and as a national political commissar i i led the secretariat of the national resistance movement and was uh, you know the one uh, to uh, project the political program of the national resistance movement and the national resistance movement at that stage came into office with a 10 point program a clear agenda of organizing a transition so the movement was a transitional arrangement in which uh, transition a new constitution would be made by the people of Uganda institutions built as dictated by the constitution and uh, have some reconciliation because of the uh, you know conflicts that we had gone through and then a free and fair election now that transition is the one that was aborted or sabotaged or overthrown by Museveni and over which we disagreed the transition was supposed to last four years and they were the four years that i lasted in government because of seeing that we had not carried out the transition we set out to carry out 
and that we were manipulating to take the country back to where it was. We disagreed and he was thrown out of government after those four years. And so even when I went into political contestation and the first elections, the election of 1996 and the election of 2001, political parties were banned. So everybody was supposed to participate in the, in the political processes through the national resistance movement by law. <laughs> A national resistance movement that was indeed led by the person you would be contesting, <laughs> you'd be contesting with. So I, I, I was not under any illusion that the ground, political ground, was heavily tilted against anybody challenging uh, the national resistance movement and its leader. And I was also very conscious of the state of capture of the other institutions because the military which had captured the state went on now to capture all the other institutions. And what you are talking about, the progressive worsening of elections, the progressive worsening of abuse of rights and so on, has been advised or it can be seen from two angles. One is that there has been progressive capture of the institutions and the more they are captured, the less the space of, uh, you know, non-conforming uh, members of the, of the society. Uh, but secondly, in 1986, after the war, there was a huge euphoria, Ugandans believing, just as they did before when Idi Amin was deposed, that, uh, you know, there is a new dawn and uh, things are going looking up and uh, people were expectant that things were going to be fine from there. So there was a lot of support for the movement and for its leader, um, Mr. Museveni. Now, just like me, who was now inside and seeing things from close quarters uh, take the wrong direction, increasingly people started seeing that uh, what they had hoped for was not happening and indeed that uh, the opposite uh, was beginning to happen. So the discontent, popular discontent, has been growing uh, exponentially, in fact, from then up to now. And the more the popular discontent, the more the repression to keep it in check. <laughs> so we, we have had uh, greater control of the institutions and the use of the institutions to repress increasingly the mounting discontent from the population. And, 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 and frankly, you know, if you look at the elections, I think the, the only election that M Mr. Museven may have won, and even that uh, with uh, several caveats, is the first one of 1996. Why I say that it also has a caveat is because no other organization was allowed to contest. So they said that everybody must participate as an individual, but an individual participating against an organized uh, NRM with the structures from the village up to the national level when no other political party would, was allowed to organize. So it was uh, inherently rigged. Uh, but uh, one would, maybe dare say that unnecessarily, because at that time there was still a lot of support uh, for the new government. Uh, it was no longer very new at that time. It was now coming to 10 years and uh, 
quite a number of people were disillusioned and certainly the people in northern Uganda, the war there had started. Uh, but even then, on the balance of probabilities, maybe, uh, even without rigging, uh, Museveni may have won that election and, and the only one. Um, so you are asking, you know, in spite of all this, we continue, we have been continuing to uh, challenge Museveni. So uh, part of uh, what advises, certainly what I have been doing in challenging Museveni four times that I have since 2001 has been first and foremost to use the relative space that is granted and i must say it is granted by the by the regime in order to procure some acceptability that you know they pass through elections uh, so they, they, they are trying to look for some level of legitimacy and therefore organize an election whose outcome they definitely know uh, and control, but uh, we want, you know, some media people to come and say, well, there was some campaign and, uh, and an election happened. In that process, some small space is created that would otherwise at other times would not be available to go and talk directly to the population. Uh, nobody can hold a public rally in Uganda at any other time. <laughs> Outside the election. Outside the, the, those elections. Uh, and so uh, it's a useful time to now make the population aware those who are not aware of what is going on say by the way this is what has happened the capture of this of our country is in this form what is causing the lack of services the lack of goods that the public should be providing to you is because you are resources uh, you have no control over them. You, the owners of those resources, you cannot determine uh, that your taxes should now be committed to education of your children or to your own health. Uh, it is those who captured the state that are using your resources to make sure you don't uh, speak, to make sure that uh, uh, they bribe leaders, to make sure that they buy uh, arms and uh, you know other paraphernalia to repress uh, those who oppose them and so on. So it's a time to conscientize the population to appreciate the situation in which the country is and to call them to action. Uh, and, and, and so that is a critical uh, motivation for us to participate in those elections. Secondly, uh, it is also to help in building the organizational competencies of the society. Because as I have said, in 2001, when I was a candidate, it was only NRM. Nobody was allowed to, to, to form a party. But because we wanted to, to participate in the elections, uh, so we formed what was called Elect Kiza Base J Task Force. And the Elect Kiza Base J Task Force formed committees at the district, <laughs> okay, okay. At, the, at the lower levels. So you rebranded it. So, you didn't call it a political party. No, so, so it, it was for an election. You know, you have to have an, an, a campaign team. Now that that campaign team becomes a mechanism of of organization and communication, so that you can then speak with one voice, and you can also act in concert. And and indeed, after that two zero one election, uh, we were able to go to court, and that time the courts were not yet completely taken over as they are today and argue that um, 
because Museveni was uh, deceiving the world that NRM was not a one-party state. He was saying it was a no-party state, that there were no parties, and everybody was supposed to organize as ind individuals. So because of the evidence of what had happened in 2001, because under that threat, he had even actually called all the structures of NRM to endorse him as a, as a, <laughs> as a kind of, because I also came saying, by the way, as you know, I was the national political commissar of NRM. <laughs> and so I am, a, I am an NRM candidate. And so he said, no, 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 no. So that's, he was forced to call the NRM structures to endorse him. Now, so we said, you know, so clearly NRM is a political organization that sponsored a candidate. So it cannot claim that it's a, a, a movement that is no party. So we were able to argue in the courts and the courts agreed with us that this was a one party state, which our constitution did not tolerate. So they said, since it is clear that there is a one party state, this is unlawful, other parties must be allowed to organize. And that's how we now want to have a multi-party dispensation. It was through that struggle. Um, and, um, and, you know, so elections, I can say without any fear of contradiction, have increasingly become just uh, a formality as the state institutions became more and more captured. So after the 2001 election, we again ran to court to petition against the outcome of that election and to present the heinous crimes and uh, malpractices that had been uh, you know, visited on that election. And indeed, the courts, again, agreed with all our grounds of petition and ruled indeed unanimously, the whole quorum of the Supreme Court ruled that the election was not free or fair. And that whatever we petitioned on was proved to have happened. What then became a problem was what to do with that election. And we have a law that uh, created uh, uh, an avenue, an unfortunate avenue that was exploited, which was saying that having arrived at all that, each judge would then say whether all that had been found affected the outcome of the election in a substantial way. And therefore the election to be annulled. Now substantial was subjective. <laughs> According to each judge to determine what was substantial. And through that um, uh, weakness in the law, the state the regime, then managed to coerce and uh, influence the judges in other ways that have since been exposed. But even with that, the court was divided halfway because in 2005, 2001, the, the Supreme Court that had the petition had five judges and three voted to uphold the election, two voted to cancel it. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, uh, although um, the election and all these things happened, we were able to use the institutions at least to the extent that it would expose all this for the whole world to see, to de de indeed delegitimize the regime, to show that this was not a free and fair election, so you are a leader arising out of an election that is not free or fair and so on and so forth. And, and that struggle too in 2006, 
after 201 unfortunately I, whatever the case i had to run out of the country into exile again i stayed in south africa for four years but returned on the eve of the next election 205 uh, and uh, that time i was not given much chance i was arrested 14 days after returning uh, i was subsequently nominated from prison uh, charged with uh, treason terrorism rape and illegal possession of fire <laughs> <laughs> they threw the book at you, they say. Yes. <laughs> Everything they could find, yes. whatever they could. Yes. But uh, so we went through another very difficult election and uh, we petitioned the outcome in the courts. Uh, pretty much went the same way as 201. That time the quorum was seven judges, it divided four to three. But again, you know, the, 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 uh, projection of the problems was uh, but following that and the decay of uh, the processes of elections the 211 election i think was the watershed to show that electoral processes are now completely meaningless first of all those points i am talking about were really made uh, everybody knew and so on and so after two, 2011 uh, that's when we said uh, really elections can now no longer serve any meaningful purpose <laughs> there's nothing to reform of course. yes yes and, and so we started a different struggle now really to liberate the country from captivity from capture from the capture now. Uh, it, the, it cannot be liberated through processes that are organized and led by those who captured the country. <laughs> we must organize citizens, empower them to resist and uh, to bring down uh, the force that uh, captured the country. And that is the process that has been going on uh, since then. So. Uh, I've been uh, indicating that indeed talking about uh, those of us who are challenging the regime as opposition is a bit misnomerous because opposition more or less presupposes that there is a government party a uh, majority party that has been elected and they are those who are uh, organized to challenge that uh, electorally and uh, are still in a minority contesting to become a majority. This is not the dynamics. The dynamics we are dealing with is that of captors and captives. <laughs> So we are organization and organizing from the captives in the country to free themselves and to regain their citizenship. Because uh, frankly, we don't have citizen rights. And that's what the struggle is about, to regain our voice, to regain our uh, political rights, economic rights, and social rights, and so on, and, um, and, 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 and that we shall do so through struggle. Uh, and that is what is uh, happening up to now. Uh, so whether it's the civil society organizations, whether it is uh, faith-based organizations, whether it is political parties, because even political parties have no space. They, they, they frankly can't pass for what a political party should do. A political party which cannot organize freely within the population, uh, have meetings of even party members and so on, and have party members contribute to its running and so on, does not fit the bill of being called a political party. Is that legally not allowed? Are the political parties... They are legally allowed but practically not allowed you know you this is what i'm saying you cannot hold 
a public meeting. Uh, you cannot raise funds uh, freely that you are holding a fundraising or members, uh, organizing members to support their party and so on and so forth. So for all intents and purposes, uh, political parties simply can't uh, function. And so what, and, 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 and the leaders who are in all these parties are then permanently uh, persecuted and prosecuted and, <laughs> and um, harassed. Uh, whatever they are doing is uh, crippled. And um, so uh, we are not in the sphere of political contestation uh, mediated by uh, electoral processes. The electoral processes are completely for the sake of uh, legitimization of, uh, of, of a military junta in the case of Uganda. Because uh, different from say what is happening, what happens in Tanzania, where there are also challenges of those who oppose government. But in Tanzania since independence, first of all, the military has not been in the, at the center stage of managing politics. Uh, and, uh, you know, to some extent, I believe they are, uh, the, the, the rule of law, uh, you know, plays out. And uh, you, you have uh, uh, governments changing. And, and new leaders coming, whether they are from the CCM, but the fact that one leader goes and another leader comes and there are contestations even for that leadership within the party, uh, who will come up and who will not, and uh, you know, th 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 that creates a different uh, kind of scenario from ours where, le where the population simply has no participation. Uh, no voice, no, even those who are within the NRM, you know, they have never for the, uh, it, it, it's now 37 years, about 37 years with Museveni as the leader of NRM, there has never been an election for the leader of NRM within NRM. <laughs> <laughs> even, even, even for formality to say, you know. <laughs> Let's pretend. <laughs> Let's... Uh, one very important question that I cannot uh, leave out is about torture, um, physical assault that happened to you personally. I think primarily my, my conviction is it was supposed to make an example of you so that it would deter anybody who challenges Museveni or the regime. But also we've seen recently that there are more and more young people who have been abducted, uh, who have disappeared, uh, who have been tortured. Some have lived to tell. Uh, we have got like the author Kakwenza who actually talked about personally being tortured by even people that he recognized from the regime. Uh, can you speak a little bit about that? And also one of the things that concerns a lot of people is your health following some of these really outrageous and brutal torture processes that you've gone under. Oh, uh... Like I said a little earlier, the more the regime of uh, Mr. Museveni becomes threatened by mounting popular discontent, the more repressive and vicious it becomes. And yes, of course they don't... Uh, like me or anybody who poses a threat to their power. And uh, they will be quite happy to inflict pain on me. But I, like you said, I believe the purpose of the torture that they meet out to us is not primarily intended for us as it is intended for the population to say that is the person you thought was your leader. If we can do this to him, know what we can do to you. <laughs> so they want to create a chilling effect 
in the population so that everybody can keep quiet and freeze wherever they are. Uh, that is the, the main thrust, and this is what they will do to all who uh, pose this kind of challenge. And yes, of course, Uganda, first of all, is a country, just like most of the African countries, of young people, in fact, of children, because half our population is below 15 years. 15 years and below is half, 50% of the population uh, are children. You know, so if you go 18, where the uh, cutoff for the children is, you know, you are, it's a great majority of the people of Uganda. And uh, the demography, the, the demographic uh, portion that is between 18 and 30, 35 uh, is, uh, is very, very huge. Now, this is where the biggest unrest in the country lies because they have no jobs, they have no livelihoods, they have no education opportunities, they have no hope, uh, and, uh, and, and so they are extremely restless and indeed looking for change and embracing whatever uh, promises that change. And, uh, and, and, and so uh, it's the uh, section of our population that now the regime is targeting to cause that uh, freezing of their agitation. And indeed, so whoever they suspect is organizing, leading, or even expressing uh, uh, views on radios or what, or social media, they, 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 they hunt for them, abduct them, and many disappear without trace. Some are found dead somewhere in sugarcane plantations or where uh, yet other hundreds upon hundreds are in jails uh, in different parts. Those who land in jails are the uh, lucky ones who now appear in courts. Quite often now what they use are the military courts uh, where they charge them with, uh, you know, or any kind. They say, you know, they found you with a military uniform or something. The reason they charge them in the military courts is that it is more difficult there to, uh, you know, process things like bail for lawyers to go there and argue and uh, there are military uh, judges there and uh, they, they, they are not willing to listen to all these uh, what uh, ordinary professional, even, even though uh, also captured civilian uh, judges or, or magistrates would find it difficult uh, to, to, to do. And, uh, you know, where the media is upon their faces and so on. So those courts have tended after some time to grant them bail. In any case, the constitution dictates that if you are held without being tried for such a time, you will be released on bail and things like that. But in the military court, they are, they are remanded. Some have been there for five, 10 years without trial, without any hope of trial, and they are forgotten in the, in the prisons. So, uh, and, and regrettably, uh, though we have been talking about this, and this escalated after the last election, because as you know, in the last election, there was uh, the candidate uh, Robert Chagulani, popularly known as Bob Wine, uh, who was, uh, you know, first of all, a young person too, 
quite popular already from his uh, musical background um, and who inspired many young people to, to, to come up and agitate. And there was a, a demonstration during that election in November of uh, last year, where again the military came out and uh, brazenly, you know, shot at people, killed many people, according to government's own admission. Uh, they admit having killed, I think, 53 people uh, on that day. Uh, they say 20 of them were rioters and others were caught in a, in a crossfire. Uh, but it's the, the majority of those that have been that have been detained and who are still uh, rotting in those uh, prisons and dungeons and torture chambers and safe houses and all kinds of things started from uh, that that event and and, and continues. Uh, so, but it, it, it spreads out to all young people, regardless of uh, who, whom you support, or as long as you're active uh, in exposing and challenging the regime, you are treated in pretty much the same way. So, and, and as I was saying, you know, regrettably, though we have been talking about this, but somehow I think the regime's uh, public relations uh, infrastructure, which they spend a lot of money, has been blocking uh, the sufficient, uh, you know, uh, capture of this uh, terrible situation in the international uh, airwaves. Uh, so it's hardly known, you know, and of course there has also been many things that uh, drown it out, you know, the war in Ukraine, you know, the uh economic crisis in the world uh, caused by covid and the war in ukraine and so on so there are many things that have helped to drown out uh a, a very very terrible situation that uh, we are grappling with uh, in the country but be that as it may um really the task the primary task of uh, improving governance in our country squarely falls on us Ugandans. Nobody will, uh, even when they know the situation, they may help, may be in one or another, but at the end of the day, we have to do the heavy lifting uh, ourselves, and that's what we are committed to doing. So very quickly, a little bit about your health before I go to the final question. Uh, Health-wise, uh, uh, we have seen, um, and, and I, I do believe you just disclosed that during those tortures and everything, there has been a huge impact on your health. How are you right now? How is your health? And do you think you can take on another campaign? Well, by the grace of God, I have been well, or well enough to continue doing what I need to do. Uh, it, it continues to be a great uh, concern, uh, in fact, threat, because even when um, we are detained in the different detention facilities, that is the greatest worry. Uh, in Uganda, quite a number of people have died uh, in what is uh, popularly believed to be poisoning uh, situations, uh, including those who have been serving in the regime itself, uh, but believed to have been developing cold feet or challenging internally in some ways. And so the whole question of use of poisoning is a big worry to all of us, especially during times uh, when our liberty is uh, deprived and uh, I try after incarcerations to have uh, medical checkups and to try and um, uh, you know in one way or another mitigate whatever effects there may have been of incarceration but of 
oh, by and large, as I have said, and I believe it's uh, in, entirely by the grace of God, I have been uh, okay and uh, able to do all that I believe I can do, including to continue challenging the regime on the streets. And I'm not about to stop. <laughs> Uh, as as long as I'm able to do so, I will continue pushing back uh, until m my ultimate objective is that we should have a transition from gun rule to rule by popular will and that we must live in a country where we have equal rights, where we are equal before the law, where we have equal opportunities um, and, uh, and, and the full range of freedoms. And uh, as I have said, my entire life has already been spent doing that. I don't have much to salvage by not continuing to do so. So my uh, very clear determination is to continue doing so until that happens. Uh, as I have pointed out, I don't expect that change will come through the mediation of elections organized by the regime. I don't really think so. And um, my mission has never been right from the word go to become uh, the political leader of Uganda. No, my mission has been to have a democratic dispensation in Uganda where I can live with my full rights. So, uh, you know, if it, somebody is who, who can contest and if there is a need to contest and at the end of the transition, I believe there will be uh, hopefully a free and fair elections where there and we can choose a leader to who who must become a servant you know because now and that's the major transition from master <laughs> to servant <laughs> uh, uh, and who must serve our will <laughs> you know so yeah i hope that uh, Again, it can only be by the grace of God that we shall see that before I retire from this life. But also, just to, to, to make it clear, you said that the entire uh, government has been captured. So it's the courts, it's everything. So it's not only a matter of getting Museveni out, but it's, it's just, yeah. yeah. So what, what is your take in terms of the long term? So the long term, transition mechanisms that will bring a new dispensation do not take, I don't emphasize that that will take a long time because that should take enough time to have the legal institutional framework in place. And so for that, we need uh, the constitution making process a new constitution making process, now a constitution being made by those who have power, the people of Uganda that have regained their citizenship and uh, their, 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 their power to, 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 to enact a framework for themselves. Uh, that should not take a very long time. Uh, we need uh, then to rebuild the institutions that the new constitution puts in place. And that may take a bit of time, and not very much though. Um, yes. Yeah, certainly a few years, maybe two years, maybe may take a bit of time. Uh, and and so, so that you have competent, and independent institutions that you don't have a military which is beholden to so and so. That it's an independent, professional military, police, uh, you know, electoral body, 
uh, financial, maybe the Bank of Uganda, maybe you have an independent um, or, or prosecutor, public prosecution body, you have an independent, all these uh, uh, bodies that uh, people give power to manage uh, important functions then need to be created in that way. Very much like what Kenya went through after their constitution making process. Uh, they went on to create new institutions and to um, man them. Like the, the way the judiciary in Kenya now selects judges is completely different where you have the public participating in that process where the president only has a ceremonial function of signing off who the chief justice is. He has no power to select one. <laughs> he can only sign on uh, who the chief justice is. So the, it's the time to do exactly that and, uh, and then to organize now, what will be needed after long periods of conflict like ours in Uganda is also a, a process of truth-telling, uh, justice and reconciliation, where we, we, people will want to know, you know, who killed all these people whose scars I was talking about, who, the war in northern Uganda, which was, uh, which also left a lot of uh, atrocities along its way and other things that have happened in the country, the various conflicts that have taken place, to have an understanding of how these happened, to have those who committed uh, heinous offenses uh, go through a justice system, uh, even if it's for forgiving them, but uh, to own up to their crimes and uh, be managed so that society knows that, uh, you know, uh, uh, they resolve the, the pain they went through. Uh, and then to have a free and fair election. Uh, that's what I emphasize in the mechanism of transition. But in terms of things changing uh, more fundamentally, that will take a much longer time because the damage is not just in these institutional things, but in communities. You know, like now, we've had a whole problem of uh, breakdown of families, breakdown of communities. Uh, so you have bigger social problems the mindset, you know, of uh, a mindset of corruption where, you know, you have a society that now no longer believes that things can be done in a straight way that, uh, you know, now those are processes that will take a bit of time. Uh, but once you have the mechanisms right and there is active, uh, empowerment of the population with the right information and knowledge. Uh, we must have civic education widely, um, you know, carried out so that citizen responsibilities are clear and so on. So those processes take a bit of time. But um, I believe that once you've sorted out the main mechanisms, you'll get there.